Good morning. Everybody awake this morning? Wasn't that some powerful worship? Uh, I love to, to be able to, to come up here and just share God's word after we, uh, we worship him like that. And uh, I think uh, what Shana said was, was so key um, that at, at times God wants to uh, fill us up, but we can run empty pretty quick. But our, our prayer and our heart is that we would begin to, uh, as, a, as a church, as, as different people individually, uh, begin to overflow with his love, overflow with who our God is, overflow with uh, how he's changed us, what he's done in our life, and, and just moving us. We're in the middle of a, a series. This is the second week of a, a four-week series called Overflow, and we're looking at uh, how God's love comes into our life, and it begins to fill us, and it begins to change us, and that moves us to this overflow of obedience, this overflow of of following him and, and living for him. And, and I get to preach this week. Next week, we have uh, Daniel Spittler's going to come and he's going to share the word with you guys. And I'm excited about that and uh, to hear just uh, what God has to, to share through him on this matter. And last week, we talked about overflow. We talked about how uh, faith is, is not an emotion, it's uh, a choice that we make. And when we choose to be uh, obedient with him, our obedience is a catalyst uh, that allows God to work in our lives. It allows God to change us. It allows God to begin to heal us, to uh, change our faith, to change our value system, to change uh, who we are, and that overflow moves into us. And our passage that we've kind of uh, adopted, the verse we kind of adopted in this is 2 Corinthians 5, 7, which is we live by faith and not by sight. We live by faith and not by sight. We follow uh, God in faith, and at times we're not going to be able to see things. At times uh, we're going to see things differently. At times we're going to miss things. At times we're going to question, we're going to doubt, we're going to have this uh, distrust and, and this struggle and this battle. But really what God calls us to is he calls us to be faithful. He calls us to be obedient to his word, to uh, trust in him and rely on him. And this morning I want to look at a passage in Matthew 25. Uh, Matthew 25, I want to look at the word, uh, a specific word, intentionality. Anybody ever heard the word intentionality? I know uh, a lot of teachers that I talk to, they love the word uh, intentionality because you have to intentionally uh, do things to make uh, uh, a process take place in the lives of a student. You know, I was thinking about VBS, and with VBS, a lot of uh, intentionality goes into our VBS. How many of you guys enjoyed uh, the decorations as you came in the door? Wasn't that great to see uh, just uh, all the time and effort that they put in uh, to those decorations? And they, they were up here um, from like 10 in the morning to sometimes uh, 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, working all day trying to get that stuff done. And this week we're going to continue to decorate. We're going to continue to uh, kind of transform this uh, church and, into a new scene to see how God has uh, trademarked us. But there's, you know, some assembly required, right? Whenever it comes to uh, God working in our life, we're not totally there yet. And so let's just continue uh, to pray for God to move in the lives of our kids uh, in VBS coming up in a week and, and how he's going to change us and, and just uh, be a, a part of that and that he is the center of it all. But this morning, we're going to look at Matthew 25 and we're going to look at the overflow and intentionality and how we intentionally have to make a move. We intentionally have to uh, do things. I remember uh, growing up, I uh, didn't really like sports. I wasn't really involved in sports. I mean, I played uh, some softball as a kid and everything else. But I mean, I know you're looking at me and going, but Robbie, you are built like an athlete. And uh, you have, you've got it made. You should have been an athlete. And uh, I, I hate to tell you this, but I was not an athlete. I always wanted to be one. Uh, but but uh, I, I was not like the greatest athlete growing up. Um, and, uh, but after high school, uh, I uh, kind of actually grew uh, a little bit more, and, and, and I could um, play a few sports and stuff like that. I uh, fell in love with the game of basketball, and uh, I love basketball. I mean, uh, I, like, I love football. I, I love soccer. I'll play any sport that you give at me. I'll try it. I'll, I'll give it a shot and everything else. But basketball has this certain appeal to me. And uh, I, I grew up uh, 
after being about 18 years old and, and, and everything else growing up, because, you know, um, for me, uh, that was whenever I kind of really kind of came into my own. And I remember entering into a uh, world. Now, there's competitive uh, basketball, and then there's more competitive basketball. You know, we can say, talk about how the NBA is competitive. We can talk about how high school is competitive, college is competitive, but none of it compares to church league. <laughs> Has anyone ever played church league basketball? Now, there's something you need to know about church league basketball is uh, the refs are blind. Um, no offense to them, but, but I don't know if they don't care. If they don't get paid well. That's probably their problem. Uh, but, but, but really, uh, my brother-in-law plays right now, and uh, he's going into his third childhood in his 40s. Uh, and um, he's uh, started uh, playing basketball again, and he's in church league. And he tells me horror stories. He comes home over to the house, and he shows me all of the bruises and, and the beat up and, and all of that stuff and, and how he's been broken down and everything else about how uh, it goes in there. And you have to, like, basically tackle somebody to get a foul call. But I remember playing uh, basketball, and like I said, I was, I was not... Not, athletic, not the greatest on the team or anything like that by far, but I love to play. I remember a time where we were playing and, and uh, the, uh, the free throws were being shot. And I remember being on the line as the man was uh, beginning to shoot his free throws. And, and I remember just being ready for that ball. You know, you line up in the box and you're ready to go and you're, you're looking at the rim and you're looking at the shooter and you're looking at the rim and you're looking at the shooter. And I'm thinking, I am going to get this rebound. You know, all five 10 of me, whatever, uh, however tall I am, I like to lie and say I'm 5'11", five, 6'0", five, foot, but I'm not. I'm probably 5'10". Uh, and um, uh, I, um, I remember just being around these guys that are 6'4", six 6'5", foot six foot and I was going to battle them for the rebound, and I was going to get the rebound. And no matter what I was going to do, and I remember thinking I'm going to get it. Well, I slipped around the guy as the ball came off the rim, and I grabbed that rebound with all of my might, and instinctively, my mind and my body said, shoot the ball. I went back up for the layup and I shot the ball and I made it. And I was just like, yeah, my entire team at this point fell to the ground. Okay. <laughs> fell to the ground in shock and in horror. Not because I had made a shot because I can make shots now. Now I'm not that bad, but I can make shots, but, but in shock and horror because I had just scored for the other team <laughs> on this monster rebound. I got to tell you, that was a, a pretty harrowing moment, right? It was a pretty, pretty, pretty bad moment. Anybody ever done that? Anybody? 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 Yeah, I love the honest people. I love it. I love it. I love the honesty of the room. But you get in that moment where you want to do it. But see, I, I was just in I mean, I kid you not, my team fell to the ground and couldn't even look me in the eyes. It was horrible. And I had to intentionally uh, begin again. I had to intentionally uh, walk back onto that court. I, had to, I mean, I wanted to pull myself out of the game, right? I wanted to be done with basketball. I wanted to find a new team. I wanted to find a new league. I wanted to find a new church uh, where people didn't look down on me and, and everything else. But it, it, it took a, an intentionality to step back onto the court. It took an intentionality to continue along because, I mean, I get you, kid you not, the next week I remember somebody saying, hey, that's the guy that scored for the other team. <laughs> and um, luckily, you know, in, in the season, other people did worse things or different things, and so we could kind of put that aside and everything else. And that's the worst thing I've ever done, and, and now I'm, I'm doing great. But, but there's a lot of times in our life where we have to intentionally move ahead. We have to intentionally uh, fight for something. We have to intentionally uh, battle. We have to intentionally be obedient in our walk with Christ. Because, to be honest, at times, we're going to fail. At, at times, we're going to fall down. At times, uh, we're going to make mistakes because all the sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? And none of us measure up. And all of us, at times make mistakes. Well, the good thing is, is that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And he gave his life so that we might live and that in our uh, falling short, he met us and he healed us and he made us new and he calls us to a life of obedience in him. But that takes uh, intentionality. That takes an action of us moving. And so today I want to look at Matthew uh, chapter 25 and, 
and looking at uh, some verses. These are the parables of Jesus where he is uh, preaching and speaking. And Jesus does a great job of giving these earthly stories with a heavenly meaning so that people can understand them. But I think at times they miss the point. And I think at times we too miss the point. So my hope today is that we don't miss it, that we can kind of unwrap it and we can kind of unpack it and we can look at it and we can say, okay, God, what are you telling me today? What do you want to uh, pour into my life today? What do you want me to see uh, today? How can I live for you? And so in speaking here in Matthew 25, he is talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom that is to come. And he's talking about his return. And he's telling his disciples that he is at one point going to go away and then he'll return. And whenever he's talking about going away, he's saying how he will ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of God. And then one day he will return. Now this might be a long journey. This might be... um, um, A journey that most of them wouldn't see the end of. Actually, none of them did, right? But see, as he's speaking to them, he's talking to them, he's saying, here's the thing is, I'm going to leave you with some stuff. I'm going to leave you with my presence. I'm going to leave you with uh, some gifts. I'm going to begin to pour into you, and I'm going to begin to change you. But you have uh, a responsibility to be obedient. You see, we don't save ourselves. Only God can save us. But once he has done that once he comes in and he makes us new we have an obligation we have a responsibility his word commands us to live for him to honor him so i want to look at this parable in matthew 25 starting in verse 14 it says again it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them to one he gave five talents of money to another two talents to another one talent each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. See, the master is about to set out on his journey, and this is representing the time of Jesus where he'll be gone, and and, and he's going to ascend into heaven, but he is going to leave with his people a a gifting and and a a, a precious thing. And this man leaves with his uh, servants, each according to their abilities, a different gift. To one, he gives five talents. To another, he gives two talents. And to the third, he gives one. And whenever I used to read this story, I used to go, wow, you know, that's not really good. Because whenever I think of talents and and what it meant, I I think of like in in kind of the concept of of, of $1, $5, and $2, right? Is that kind of the way that your mind works on that? But as I studied and I began to look at this, a, a talent would probably be comparable today to hundreds of thousands of dollars. A talent was a bag of money. All right? So this, these aren't like small gifts. And so to one we're talking, he gave like millions. To another, he gave like a million. And to the third, he gave hundreds of thousands of dollars. So even if you got one bag, how many in here would be happy with that one bag, right? We'd be okay with that. And so none of them were lacking in the gift. None of them were lacking in what he gave them. He just gave it to them according to their ability and according to what he had called them to do. And he gifted each of us. And when we look around and we see each of us have certain gifts, each of us have certain things that God has done. And these gifts, according to our ability, they can include our time. They can include our talents, our spiritual gifts, our energies, our personality traits, the experiences, our attitudes, even our material resources. And each of us are different and each of us have different giftings. And God has poured into each of us different things. And we need to admit that God gave us exactly what we need to make it. But see, oftentimes we begin to look around at others and we begin to say, wait a minute, he's got more than me or he's got this gift that I don't have or he can do that, that that I can do. I mean, I wish that I could sing like Shana does. I know that would look kind of weird coming from a man to sing like she does, but wouldn't that be cool? I mean, that's just an amazing, powerful gift that God has given her. Likewise, I know um, that B Powers is in this room and and whenever I look at B, I think of someone who is an awesome prayer warrior. I know that she is praying for me night and day. I know that she is, is, is on her knees praying for our church and doing great things. And I wish that I could pray like that. And I wish I could do certain things. And I wish I could say certain things. I wish I was all of these things. But here's the thing. God gave you exactly the right skill set to bring glory to his name. 
He gave us exactly what we need. Each and every one of us were differently created, but guess what? We were fearfully and wonderfully made to bring glory to his name. So it doesn't matter if you don't measure up to somebody else because you are exactly who God wants you to be. And he says, don't measure yourself by someone else. Measure yourself by me, and I am enough. I'm exactly what you need to lift you up and to pour into you and to be there for you. And so he gives these men, these three men, their talents. We need to realize that that was something great. Every Christian, if we were in Christ Jesus, has been entrusted with responsibilities for the kingdom. Every single one of us, if we claim the power of the cross and what God did in the cross for us and how he came in and he saved us, we have a responsibility and that responsibility is something that we have to take seriously. And some will do that. Some will take it seriously and they'll do wise things. Some will kind of uh, waste their time with it. But these gifts and these talents, they are precious to the Lord. You may be thinking, man, I, this gift, I know I can do this and I know I can do that. But really, it's not much. But the gifts that you have are precious to the Lord. And they are His. And he gave them to you to be a steward of them. He placed them in your hands what is his own. Every gift is his gift. Every precious talent, a responsibility, a thing that comes into your life and who you are was placed there lovingly by our Savior to use you and to, to pour through you. And the Lord knows us. He knows uh, the full potential of of who we are in each person for serving his kingdom. And he designed it perfectly so that potential could come forth. And no one is entrusted with more than they can handle. And no one is given less than they need. He's perfect. And the way that he gives us and creates us and pours into us, even down to the very circumstances of our life and what we've been through, those are a gifting of God, how he has shaped us and moved into us to change us and make us who we need to be. But we need to stand up and pay attention. We need to stand up and pay attention. We need to realize the love that God had for us. Not just had on the cross, but the love that he has for us. And how daily he pours into us and daily he meets our needs so that we can be the best husband that we need to be. So that we can be the best wife that we need to be. So we can be the best father, the mother, the grandparent, whatever the best worker, the best boss, whatever God calls us into, the best servant, the best proclaimer of his glory, evangelizing this world for him, bringing glory to his name. That is who he created us to be. And no one in this room is more important than the others. But get this, no one in this room is less important either. We're all equally a part of the body of Christ. And we need to stand up and pay attention to that. We need to stand up and realize that I am exactly who God created me to be and God wants to do a great work in me. And we look around and don't compare yourself to others. Don't. It's not about five talents. It's not about two talents. It's not about one talent. It's the fact that you have been gifted by him and given the talents in the first place. And what he gave you is exactly what you need to bring the greatest glory for his name possible. And God wants to do a great work in you. But it's risky business, right? It's risky business because we could fail. We could mess up. We could make a mistake. And so as we look at uh, these three men and we look at their life, there's a, a problem because often we talk ourselves out of even moving or out of even doing and really honoring God because we don't want to take the risk because we could mess up. And yeah, yeah, we're going to fall short and we're going to make mistakes. But here's the thing is even in that, God is gracious and he moves us to something greater. And we learn from our mistakes and we learn from our downfalls. And we get better. And it's risky business. But I want you to look with me at verse 16. It says, The man who had received the five talents 
went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. It's, it's, it's risky business, but see, we're called to be obedient, and our obedient faith is filled with risk, and we have to take the initiative where we're at. See, we can't take the initiative where we're going to be because we're not there yet, but where we're at, we have to start moving, and we have to start going ahead, and we have to start serving him and following him and living for him, and it says that at once, that prompt obedience, because what? You can what? Talk yourself out of it. Have you ever had God kind of speak on your heart or know that there's something that you need to do in your marriage or your relationship with your kids or your job or something and you know that you need to do it and it's like a risk but you know it's a chance you need to take and you need to get it out there and you need to do it. But eventually if you don't do it promptly, if you don't do it immediately, you eventually talk yourself out of it. And then what? Regret begins to come in, right? And we miss that opportunity and we miss that chance. The first two, they were prompt, and they went out immediately, and they doubled what they had. But the third, I think he thought about it for a while. I think he went home, and he debated it, and he thought, you know, I could mess this up. I could make this up and and everything else. And so he went, and he buried his talent. He buried his gift. He buried the beauty of what his master had poured into him. And a lot of us are doing the same. A lot of us are doing the same. We're burying what God has poured into us and what God longs to do in us and how he longs to change us and he longs to change the world around through us because we bury those gifts, because we think we're not enough, because we struggle. You see, in contrast to the first two, the third Servant played it safe by burying his talent and waiting for his master's return. He failed to realize the impact and gain that he could have for his master. And he lacked the understanding of what his master had really challenged him to do. He lacked understanding of what was really taking place. He lacked the realization that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. See, God doesn't just give us things so that we can take it and do what we want to with it or we can bury it or we can push it aside or we can forget it. But we have a responsibility to do something with the giftings of God. We have a responsibility to do with something with the talents that he's given us, the blessings that he's given us, the, the time that he's given us, the, the, the gifts and everything that he pours into us. We have a responsibility to do something with it, a life-changing responsibility to live up to our potential, to live up to the potential of, of, of what God has done. You see, we can call it a calling. We can call it a, a life work, a purpose, you know, whatever we want to call it. But the truth of the matter is, is that God has given each and every one of us a responsibility to shine for him, to live for him, to honor him, to do the best that we can for him. You see, there's quite a time gap between the master leaving and the master coming, and, and this was a, a significant opportunity to do great things and, and everything else. You know, have you ever tried to, uh, I, I know with me at times whenever uh, my wife, and I'm probably going to get in trouble because she's in the room right now, but she'll go uh, out of town on the weekend, you know, and, and she'll go out of town to go do something else and stuff like that. And so I begin to live the bachelor life with the kids, you know what I mean? And, and the house begins to kind of fall apart a little bit and it begins to get a little bit of a mess and begins to, to be that struggle and it begins to, to look worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until I realize that she'll be home in an hour and I've got to clean the entire house so she doesn't come home to the mess that I've created. Anybody like that? Yeah. And in that time, man, I'm I'm battling and I'm running and I'm rushing and I'm trying to get everything done and I'm screaming at the kids. I'm kicking the dog. You know, I'm doing everything that I can to get that house cleaned up, right? To make sure that it looks good and I'm ready for her. 
When really I've had two days to make sure it's ready and it's good and it looks all right and everything else. But what I've done is I've taken those two days to destroy what she left with me. <laughs> and you know, we haven't eaten any meals except for meals from fast food places because I'm not cooking. And so, you know, I'm cleaning up all of that and I'm battling. I'm trying to make the house look good and everything else. And it's this stressful moment. And she gets in and she walks through the door. And, you know, and it's one of those moments where, you know, it's not what it could be. And it's the same way with us and God, I think, at times. He's given us this time. He's given us this time to live for him. But, see, we, we, we live in, in, in moments and, and we're, we're, we're procrastinators and we put things off or we try to do our own thing and we try to do it in our a timely manner and we kind of cram it in there and everything else. But he's given us so much time to live for his glory. So much time to make a difference. And I see a lot of people at the end of their life or at the end of their time where they have those regrets and everything else. But what if we could live this life where at the end we didn't regret because we lived the entire time for his glory? I see a lot of people that are trying to fix their marriages right whenever they're breaking apart, right whenever they've had 15 years together and it's like, oh, Robbie, it's, it's terrible right now. But see, why didn't they pour into it for 15 years? I'm still waiting till the end. Why do we try to fix our kids right before they graduate? That's not going to happen. We've had you know, all this time with them and everything else, this time to pour into their lives and this time to change them. And we talk about the pennies and the marbles that we take out of the jar and every week and how that's important and how we need to grow in them and everything else. But see, God gives us the time that we need to do great things for his name, but a lot of times we waste it. And I wanted you to look real quick at the two uh, differences between the two and, and, and see how they, when the master shows up, it says, After a long time, the master of the servants returned, and he settles accounts with them. And the man who received the five talents brought the other five with him. And he said, Master, you've entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. I mean, look at the beauty in that. I mean, he was probably excited about it. And there's this like twinkle in his eye. Master, master, guess what? This is what I did. This is how I did it. And this is how great it looks. And, and, and I did this great thing. You gave me five talents and I've doubled it. And the master looks at him and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man with two talents also came and he said, Master, you've entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. And his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things and I will put you in charge of many. Come and share in your master's happiness. Come and share in your master's happiness. But then we see the third servant in verse 24, the man who had received the one talent. And he didn't come with joy. I think he didn't really want to come at all. And with his head held low, he said, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See? Here's what belongs to you. And the master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I had not sown and gathered where I had not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit it with the bankers. So that when I returned, it would have received back some sort of interest. And what he's saying here is he's saying, you, you knew me? You really knew me? If you knew that I was this or you really thought I was this bad person, you should have at least done this. You should have at least done something. And see, the, the problem is, is that when we look at these three, we see that two of them really knew the master. They really knew his heart. They really knew who he was. And they knew what he had in store for them. And so they went and they did great things. But see, the third one, he misunderstood the master. He really didn't know. And he allowed fear to stop him. Don't let fear stop you. 
Don't let it stop you. See, the third servant was not condemned for what he did, but for what he didn't do. And in verse 24, the master is referred to as a difficult man who unjustly expects things. And see, I think that we put that same thought on God. God, you're not fair. God, you expect too much of me. God, you want too much. You're expecting miracles. You're expecting all of these great things and everything else. And God is saying, but I gave you exactly what you needed to do it. Oh, God, but it's still too much. It's still too much. I didn't have enough time or I didn't have enough of this gift or I didn't have enough of that. And I I know how hard it is and I know what you expect and you expect too much. You see, God does have high standards and we need to remember that they are high standards. But he also gifts us and fills us and loves us and lives in us and allows us and provides for us so that we can meet those standards. So that we can bring glory to his name. You see, when we fall short, that's our fault. That's not God's fault. When we mess up, that's us getting in the way. Because we bury things or because we push them aside or because we fail to live up and see the love that he's given us. It's not his fault. And we can't let fear stop us. See, fear kept the third servant from actively using his talent. He feared the master, he feared failure, he feared falling down, he feared rejection, whatever it was, he feared it. And the problem was that he didn't know the heart of the king. I got to tell you this because I I think that this would have taken place in the story. If he would have taken and tried to do something with it, and he would have lost everything, you know what the king would have said? Well done, good and faithful servant gave it your all that was the point that was the point you gave it your all but see here's the thing is that if we really give it our all and if we really trust God with all of our talents we're not gonna fail we're not gonna fail the other two they had a lot more to lose they had a lot more to give up they had a lot more to fall short with but guess what they doubled it 100 percent return and if we're faithful and we follow him and we live for him that's a hundred percent return every time but if we refuse and we bury it you know what that return is zero it's nothing it's lifeless it's hopeless it doesn't move us see our god is a god of high standards demanding much of his servants but he never demands more Then he pours into us. He never demands more than we can produce because we are empowered with his love and his wisdom and his strength and who he is. In 2 Peter, verse 1, chapter 3, it says this, His divine power, speaking of the power power of, of Jesus in us, has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. See, it's not our glory and goodness that he calls us by. It's his glory and goodness and it's who he is and it's what he did on the cross. That moves us to perfection. That saves us. That makes us right so that we can honor him and so that we can live in him. Verse 4, it goes on, it says, Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities... In increasing measure, not if you possess these things and you bury them, but if you begin to add to them and grow them and work them and use them for his glory, if you possess these qualities in increasing 
measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Why do I not honor God? Because a lot of times I forget what he did for me. Because if I was to remember how he gave his life on the cross for me and he gave everything for me, I should be on fire living for him and gracious to the call that he gave me. And you need to know that today, that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't made him that, if you haven't received that gracious gift, because that's the greatest gift. That's the life-changing gift. It's not about talent. It's not about all of these things. It's really about a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And he came, and he gave his life for you and for me so that we could find hope and life everlasting. And that's the beginning. That's the greatest gift. If we had that alone, it would be enough. But you know what? He loved us so much, he lavished even more on us. And every day, he continuously fills us with his presence. He continuously fills us with his spirit. And he continuously grows us and challenges us and pushes us. And he is our everything. But we have to be obedient. Oswald Chambers says this. He says, add, when we add, speaking of 2 Peter, to add and... To your, to your faith, goodness, and add these things together. He says, add means that we have to do something. We cannot save ourselves. God does that. But God will not give us good habits or character. He will not force us to walk correctly with him. We must do that all ourselves. We must do that all ourselves. He gives us everything we need to do it and to live for him. But we have a responsibility to use those gifts that Jesus has entrusted us with to maximize the opportunities that he has poured into us and to bring glory to his name. I like to call that practical obedience. Practical obedience. And it looks like this. First, we make a beginning. We make a beginning. We, we realize that, that something needs to change and something needs to happen. You see, whenever he gave the giftings to the, the talents, to the, the servants, they saw this as an opportunity. And so they had a choice to make a beginning. And the first two, they made a beginning. They took the money out and they began to invest it. They began to do something with it. But for the third, it died right there. And God provides a lot of opportunities for us to be obedient. Practically speaking, what we have to begin to do is we have to make a beginning. We can't hesitate. Don't hesitate. If you hesitate, you know, if you snooze, you lose, right? If you hesitate, you begin to rethink things. If you hesitate, you miss the opportunity. Don't hesitate to make the beginning. Take the first step. Take the first step. Whatever it is, whatever God calls you to do, and then keep going. That's practical obedience. That's all it is. You make a beginning. You don't hesitate. You take the first step and then you keep going. That's what obedience is. That's what following God is. That's what living for him is. That's what it's all about. That's what we're called to do as we move with him, as we live in him, as we trust him and follow him and his gifts fill in our lives and they flow overflowing through us. That's life changing. Not for us. He's already changed our life. But that's life changing for a world that is in need. Is that through our obedience, the love of Christ overflows to a world that needs that love. You see, the world needs your gift, the world needs your talent, the world needs who you are in Christ. And God wants to use you. He longs to use you. It's not enough to just be followers of God and hang in there. It's not enough. But day in and day out, I see a lot of Christians. And day in and day out, you know, that's what I do. That's what I'm doing. I'm just hanging in there. 
but it's not enough for us to simply hang in there. We have to see ourselves as the hands and feet of God. We have to see ourselves uh, of servants. And I, I love it. As we sing the last song of worship, it says, I'm no longer what a slave to fear. I am a child of God. See, the first two servants, they realized that they were their master's children, gifted and given everything that they need. But the third struggled to be a slave of fear. And we can't do that when the world around us is dying and hopeless. We have to get into the habit of carefully listening to God about everything. Forming in the habit of finding out what he says and what he wants and then obeying that. God doesn't give us something and expect us to do nothing with it. God doesn't give us something and then expect us to do nothing with it. He gives us something so that we can do something with it. This week, I had the, the privilege of going to uh, one of our ladies' uh, new uh, office. She is, uh, she's a doctor, and she works with uh, inner ear stuff and, and works with hearing aids and, and provides care for that. And Her name is uh, Diana McPherson, and, and she does an amazing job. And She just bought a new building, and, and uh, she's been renting for the past six years, but God uh, allowed her and provided this opportunity for her to buy this new office. And and it's a great, beautiful story and, and, and incredible how God has really richly uh, blessed her. And so she asked me to come and, and before they cut the ribbon and, and did all the things to just come and just pray with them and just uh, really just be a part of it. And, you know, I was kind of, you know, not sure what uh, to do about it and how to go about it. But I got there and, man, it was the most beautiful thing because it was just her family together, gathered in there, her family, her husband Mike's family. And they were gathered together and they were ready to pray. And what she told me was she said, God is done great things through my business. She's done great things. He's done amazing things through it. And, and six years ago, she said, Pastor Dell came and he blessed my office. And, and he's done great things. And she said, I want to make sure that that continues. So I want you to be here today. And I was just, I was humbled by it. You know, it just really just kind of caught me off guard. And, and so I began to pray and I just prayed, you know, that that, that wasn't a business, that it was a mission. And it was a mission for God's glory and a mission to bring praise to his name and an opportunity for people to come in and hear Christ and hear about it and everything else. And we prayed, and, and, and I just felt the spirit of the God and everything else. When we got done praying, one of the, the family members walked up to me and they said, you need to know something. He said, two days ago, a, a lady came into the office and just walked through the doors, and, and the lady had had her uh, hearing aid had broken off. A part of it had broken off and fallen into her inner ear, and it began to to move down into her inner ear, and it was causing her a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort, and she couldn't get it out, and she showed I mean, I can just imagine the pain that she was going through. And this lady had some other health issues and, and some other struggles and, and some other hardship, and so she began to ask Diane, she's like, can you help me? And Diane said, sure, and so she began to, took the lady to the back, and she began to work on her and began to dig that piece out of her ear. And they said that the pain was so excruciating that the woman began to just weep uncontrollably and just cry and, and just, just this painful uh, experience and this horrible, painful experience of what was taking place. And, and in the middle of it, Diana got the piece out and she pulled it out and the lady was just still hysterical and just crying. And the family member told me, you know what she did next? She put the piece down and she just looked at the lady and she just embraced her. And she held her as she wept. And she showed her the love of Christ. See, it's not a business. It's a mission. It's not work. It's worship. It's living for his glory and for his sake. And see, that's what each of us are called to do. And I, I love that story because it's something simple that we can do. Just love someone. See, that uses every one of her giftings, her time, her money, her talent, her education, her heart, everything that God ha has given her into one moment where she reaches out in love and shows Christ to that woman. And that's what we're called to do. That's what it means to be the hands and feet of Christ. 
And we do that everywhere. You go into areas, you go into places that I, as a pastor, can never go. I'm jealous. I'm jealous because you can be the hands of feet of Christ like I can never be. But that's the way that he gifted you. That's the way that he called you. That's who you are. And we make up a complete body together and we work together. No one is more important. It's not all on my shoulders. It's not all on your shoulders. It's all of us together fighting for his kingdom because he has richly and graciously gifted us. I want to leave you with this last question that David Platt asked. And I think it, it feels great with where we're at. It says this. It says, do, we, do you keep watch for Christ in a way that love is the overflow of your waiting for him? Do you keep watch for Christ in a way that your love is an overflow of your waiting for him. One of the things that frustrates me the most is to see people just waiting for God. I'm waiting for him to return. I'm waiting for him to do something. I'm waiting for this to happen. And it frustrates me the most because that's who I am a lot of the time. See, my holy expectation, my holy waiting, I believe that he's coming back. I believe that he's coming back, so I should live every day in that love and in that expectation, doing something with my life to get everyone else ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. But my love needs to carry out and show everyone else so that they can be ready. And you may be ready. You may have it all set in what he did on the cross. But guess what? Those around you, they're not ready. And he gifted you and he blessed you and he poured into you so that you can take that word so that they can be ready. And then they take that love and they share it and they go. And we do that by meeting people where they're at. We don't wait for them to come to the church. We don't wait for them to come to us. We meet them right where they're at. And we bring them the gifting and the love and the precious gift of Christ right where they're at. Do you keep watch for Christ in such a way that love is the overflow of your waiting for him? That's the overflow. Practical obedience. Start. Make a beginning. Make a beginning. Don't hesitate. Take that first step and keep going. I guarantee you it's going to be beautiful. I guarantee he's going to do amazing things through you because that's exactly who he is. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your truth. God, I I just ask you right now that if there's someone in this room that doesn't know you, they would see that you are everything that we need. That you are exactly what we need in our brokenness, in our hopelessness, in our emptiness. God, we just have to lay aside the pride and say, I need you. We know the hole is there. We know the emptiness is there. We know that feeling is there. They just have to call on you. God, my prayer today is if someone doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, they would do that. They would make you their all. Just as your word says, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. And God, I know that there are those in this room who have done that, and I thank you for that, but that's not the end. We don't get to accept your son as our Lord and Savior and then bury him in the dirt. We have to take him and bring glory and take those talents and those gifts and the things that you pour into us and bring glory to your name, God. And so this morning, I want to commission these people, God. I want to commission this body to go out and be your hands and feet, to meet people where they are with the gospel of Christ. God, I want to see people saved. I want to see people set free. I want to see people uh, just, just on fire for you and living for you. But that comes at a cost, and that cost is our obedience. May we raise the standard, God. May we go out and shine for you, God. 
May we not waste a moment, a talent, a, a, an aspect of our lives, God, that we work to bring into your favor for your glory. Let us be your servants, God. We're no longer slaves to fear. We're children of God, co-heirs with Christ, called to bring glory to your name. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. We thank you that even though we fall short, you're there to carry us. And you're there to pick us up. And we want to do great things for your kingdom. For your name's sake. In your name we pray. Amen.